So we are continuing our uh, look at uh, modern eugenics this morning. Um, got the uh, two handouts for you, the, the outline like I, we usually have, but also this handout. Um, this one has the, uh, like I was saying, the kind of the, some of the prominent figures in the eugenics movement from the last uh, century and the 1900s on there. And there are more to be had, there are more to be uh, said than just on that list. And there are even uh, modern proponents of eugenics in, in the 21st century as well. Uh, but this covers a lot of the, the big ones from the, uh, the 1900s. So that's just for your um, own edification and, and to kind of see where people were coming from, at least in the last century as it, as it comes to eugenics. Any questions or anything from uh, before we dive in again to look at uh, modern eugenics, uh, new label but the same contents? It's interesting to see the new people, the names of the people who are associated with it. Right, right, like... Uh, Winston Churchill? Yeah, Winston Churchill, he expressed uh, support of eugenics. Um, several U.S. presidents did. Alexander Graham Bell is on there. So um, you can see that this was not, uh, even though we haven't really been taught about eugenics, so even though we haven't really been taught about eugenics in our uh, public high schools and, and public schooling, um, it was a big movement, right? I mean, when you get people like U.S. presidents on board, you know, these major figures, um, it's not just some small backwater thing we're talking about. This is a major, major world influence and world power, you know, certainly last century, but I argue in this century as well. So any other follow-up questions there? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah, please bring that in. Um, you, you bring up a good point that there are still threats, modern threats from the eugenics movement uh, for these, especially uh, people who have these disabilities. Um, there are still voices who call for the elimination of you know, people with genetic defects like Down syndrome, things like that. There are people who call for this. And you're right, um, at, at least anecdotally, I was just at the uh, orchard yesterday, um, Kane's Orchard, and picking apples and with a family, and we bumped into a, a young woman there who I assume had Down syndrome. I mean, I didn't ask her if she did, but it seemed like she did. And she was just the happiest, most friendly person that you could talk to, and, and she was just so full of joy to be at this apple orchard. I mean, I, I walked away from that conversation with her uh, more joyful than I, I was before I went in. It's just, you know, there, there are some things that make it harder for a person with Down syndrome, but then there are some things that make life uh, even more uh, beautiful and enjoyable. And, and sometimes I think that uh, they have an advantage over us that we couldn't even dream of in our kind of what would be considered normal life. Yeah, everyone around her was just, you know, smiling and because of her presence there, she was just joyful. So it was really beautiful. I just wake up in five minutes and... Almost like a totally carefree existence. Yeah, yeah. It, it truly is beautiful. All right, well, uh, I want to kind of open things up here with a little devotion. Um, and Bible study from God's Word. Uh, who is my neighbor? The parable of the Good Samaritan. So if you want to follow along, I'm going to be reading from Luke chapter 10, beginning at verse 25. Uh, this is, again, the parable of the Good Samaritan, one of the best-known parables in the Bible. And it begins this way, And behold, of course, this isn't the parable. This is an introduction to it. And behold, 
a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now, by chance, a priest was going down the road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he sent him, he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day, He took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, You go and do likewise. Okay, so that's the parable of the Good Samaritan. So, Who is my neighbor? Was it the priest, the Levite, or the Samaritan? How does, how do you think Jesus answers that question um, of who is my neighbor? How did it play out? Who who was the neighbor to the man? Right. The Samaritan, or as we call him, the good Samaritan, because he's the one who stopped and had compassion on this man who was beaten. Now, one of, uh, kind of on a surface level reading of this parable, um, one of the things that we would imply about the man who was beaten is that he was a Jew, right? So if, um, it would be kind of like uh, locally here, if if you said a man was going from Black River Falls down to, to Melrose. Well, you would just assume that that man was a citizen of Jackson County, Wisconsin, the United States. He was just a regular man, right? So this man going from Jerusalem down to Jericho is in all likelihood a Jew. And so when this Samaritan comes along, well, you, you, you would think that the priest and the Levite would help. But it wasn't the priest or the Levite that helped the man who was beaten. It was the Samaritan. And so we know from the scriptures and from history uh, that Jews and Samaritans were enemies. They were related to each other distantly, but, but they hated each other, and they were not supposed to be friends. And so Jesus, you know, he obviously show, tells this parable to show that um, your neighbor is even your enemy, right? I mean, the Jews and the Samaritans were enemies, So what kind of implications, and and the interesting thing is, you know, the question was, who is my neighbor? But Jesus takes the question and he turns it a little bit, he modifies it, and he says, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? So, So Jesus is not asking simply, who is my neighbor? He's asking, who proved to be neighborly? And that's what it's about. So, so what, what implications does this have for us and who is our neighbor? Well, what Jesus tells in this parable, God tells us explicitly in 1 Corinthians 1. This is to kind of circle back. Remember, we, we were in 1 Corinthians 1 at the very start of this study where we found out that the word eugenics is actually in the Bible, surprisingly. Um, even though Francis Galton kind of coined it for his own purpose, um, 
uh, later in history, but, but eugenics is in the Bible. Remember? Not many of you were well-born. Not many of you were eugenic. So if we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning at verse 26, for consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. And there, the word translated noble birth is again this whole word eugenics. Not many of you were eugenic. Not many of you were well born. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. So uh, God chooses the weak, the lowly, the losers, the people who could do nothing for themselves. He chooses those people to be in his family. And so um, the implications of this for who is our neighbor is uh, Jesus is inviting us to have ever-widening, ever-expanding circles of those we include in our uh, neighborly care, right? He's not putting limitations on who is our neighbor, but he's inviting us to reach out and stretch out to someone who we normally wouldn't uh, think about caring for you know, and being neighborly to. So rather than the eugenic um, kind of push to, to make a narrower and narrower definition of who fits into the human family and who we treat neighborly, uh, God is inviting us to have a broadening and expanding definition of that and to reach out to those people who maybe are harder to take care of and be neighborly to. You know, stopping along the side of the road for a man beaten by robbers is, is not an easy thing, right? It, it takes some sacrifice for us. And yet, uh, God says that uh, the one who acts neighborly to this man, this is the one uh, who shows mercy and who proves to be a neighbor. So God invites us to love and serve even our enemies as our neighbor, as Christians anyway. Okay, so just to review, recap here, what we've kind of covered about eugenics, especially so far. Remember, eugenics is the quest to genetically enhance future generations, both through a positive approach, a positive eugenics approach, where you encourage more superior people to be born, and also through a negative approach, where you seek to discourage the inferior people from passing on their genes or from being born so that there's less inferior uh, genetic uh, people in the population. And remember, we, we said that this could be done in both a coercive manner, eugenics could be pursued in a coercive manner, like with forced sterilizations, but it can also be pursued in more of a consumeristic or individual choice type manner, right? You could easily pursue this on an individual level, um, as in what I would argue is modern eugenics, where uh, individuals and, and individual families are encouraged to only have the most genetically fit uh, human beings and only to welcome those children into their family and not uh, the less genetically fit. So that's kind of um, a little bit of a recap of eugenics. And we also talked about uh, eugenics after World War II having fallen out of favor at least in, in terms of like a public um, kind of uh, a public uh, relations type way, uh, was to talk about eugenics openly was, was not very popular with most of the public. So the eugenic organizations kind of shifted their strategy and their tactics and they advocated for crypto eugenics or pursuing eugenic goals um, in more of a, a hidden or secret, secretive fashion. And so we had this shift in emphasis from outright eugenics to um, terms that you're probably very much more familiar with, which is population control and family planning. 
So eugenic goals were pursued under these uh, headings now, population control and family planning. And again, there's this shift in emphasis from coercion to individual choice in eugenic decision-making. Um, however, as we saw, coercion was still, is still on the table for a lot of these eugenic-minded types, um, as, was saw, as was seen by the fact that forced eugenic sterilization continued uh, well into the 20th century after World War II came to a conclusion. And we talked about, uh, we left off last time talking about a genetic counseling study uh, from a sociology professor, um, Professor Wirtz, who uh, found that there is a eugenic bias in genetic counseling today um, for families and couples who are having children that are found to have some sort of a genetic uh, condition. They are, they are kind of pushed and herded towards the eugenic elimination of children with um, genetic uh, abnormalities, genetic conditions like Down syndrome. And is this, is this just kind of like uh, something that I'm making up? No, it's not. It's well documented in the medical literature. So here is a slide of, uh, well, I say genetic counseling, crypto eugenics. This is a graph of um, uh, Down syndrome, uh, children who are, who are found to have Down syndrome in the womb, so that's an antenatal diagnosis of having Down syndrome. At least the test indicates that they have Down syndrome. There are false positives, but the test indicates they have Down syndrome. And then um, the families that then choose to abort after they found that their child has or potentially has Down syndrome. And this is, this is a, a, a medical journal from England and Wales Okay, so this is not our United States context, um, but, but globally, um, the numbers are, are very similar. The, the vast majority of children who are found to have Down syndrome in the womb are aborted. But here you can see, in, at least in this, this study, from about a span of about 20 years, from 1990 on, almost every year, and it's so constant, almost every year, more than 90% 90% or more of those children were then aborted. Children found to have Down syndrome in the womb. So the average, that dotted line there is the average. The average is 92% from this study. 92% of children with Down syndrome were aborted in this 20-year period. And that's a pretty high number, you know, that's shocking. I mean... The old school eugenicists, right? Francis Galton, Charles Davenport, all these kind of old school eugenicists from earlier in, the 19, in, earlier in the 1900s, they would have salivated at results like this. I mean, they, they would want to see 100% abortion rate, right? But 90%, 92%, that's pretty high. Also, um, on the same note, you may have seen in the news in the past couple of years, um, there are even countries bragging about how they eliminated Down syndrome. Iceland was one of these countries that there's news reports that the health officials in Iceland were, were saying, we have eradicated Down syndrome because they had such a vast um, and extensive array of genetic testing and premarital counseling for couples who are having children. And the abortion rate was so high that they said they eradicated Down syndrome. Now, what's, what's wrong with saying that they eradicated Down syndrome? I mean, think about that. They're, they're testing for Down syndrome, and then they're aborting the child, the children that are found to have Down syndrome. How is it inaccurate to say that they eradicated Down syndrome? They didn't eradicate it. They just killed those people. Exactly. It's not like they found a cure for Down syndrome or something like that. Like, if you just take this pill, you won't have Down syndrome anymore. That would be eradicating Down syndrome or finding a cure, right? What they're actually saying is, every child we find with Down syndrome, we, we go on a search and destroy mission so that we eliminate them from our population. So it's probably more um, accurate just to say that they, they're killing all children with Down syndrome that are found to have Down syndrome in the womb. That's really what they're doing. 
It's not like they cured Down syndrome or something like that. Here's some more on genetic testing. Um, I, I labeled this slide eugenic language because this is on, this is uh, Philippa Levine, Dr. Levine's book on uh, eugenics, a very short introduction. And remember, um, Levine, uh, she's the one who posited that there is a continuing eugenic kind of movement after World War II. And she's the one who identified, helped us identify that the eugenics movement kind of shifted from coercion to more of a consumer choice, individual choice type emphasis, okay? But she's the one who is saying that, um, you know, there is this eugenics still present among us, this eugenic type thinking still present among us after World War II. It's not like it just disappeared. So Levine is critical of the eugenics movement, but I found her language here to be um, just stunning, how she describes the beta thalassemia um, genetic uh, cases in Cyprus. So in Cyprus, the island of Cyprus um, in the Mediterranean, um, there is high rates of this genetic condition, beta thalassemia. Um, it's highly prevalent recessive gene disorder there. In the 1970s, a genetic screening program and counseling for couples whose children are found to have um, beta thalassemia um, and then counseling towards abortion, um, there was a, a program to do this, a targeted campaign to eliminate, again, children found to have beta thalassemia, just like we we're talking about with Down syndrome. And then in, 19, in the 1980s, um, premarital screening for this genetic condition was actually made compulsory. It's required for you to get married in Cyprus. So this is explicitly this is explicitly a eugenic policy. And Levine notes this. She says, and this is where I, I think the, the language is stunning to me. She says, the screening policy had clear eugenic roots, but was tightly directed to one well-understood condition for which there was a practically foolproof test nullifying charges of discrimination then she went on to say that this program was, quote, hugely successful at stamping out beta thalassemia. So there again, you see that this idea that if you can just eliminate the children who have the genetic condition, that that is, quote, a hugely successful program. It's, it's eugenic through and through. Now, why... Why do you think I, I italicize this? Nullifying charges of discrimination. That, that italics is mine. I added that. Why, why do you think that struck me as being so fantastic, so out there? Because discrimination is, has a negative uh, asset to it, and by putting that on there, uh, you're making the whole idea more palatable. Right, right. So they, they don't want to suffer charges of discrimination. But here's the, this whole program is specifically targeting children with beta thalassemia. It's explicitly discriminatory. It's like the definition of discrimination. There's no nullifying charges of discrimination here. But when, you know, this gets into the whole abortion debate and whether or not you say that the child is a human, which clearly it is, um, no embryology scientist would, would deny that this is a human being. But when you get into this kind of illogical position that it's, well, it's, it's not quite a human being, well, then I suppose you could say it's not discrimination, but this is a, that's a pipe dream. It's, it's eugenic discrimination from start to finish. And, and even someone like Levine, who is critical of the eugenics movement, even someone like her, she slips into this eugenic language, calling this a hugely successful program. Remember, what does it mean to be hugely successful in a program like this? What is she saying happened to those children? 
Yeah, they got killed. They were aborted. They were stamped out of existence. That's what she's saying was successful. So even someone like Levine, you know, is, I mean, this is eugenic language and a eugenic attitude, isn't it? It's just, it's just beyond words. It's beyond description. All right. I've got a, a little video coming up here um, about a fertility clinic. Predetermining the sex of your baby. It may sound like something out of science fiction, but it's happening right here and right now in this Los Angeles fertility clinic, and the doctor performing the procedure says it's become a booming business. Dr. Jeffrey Steinberg is a fertility specialist who has developed a niche. He allows couples to choose the sex of their child. How many of them want boys? How many want girls? It's an interesting question, and it really turns out to be about 50-50. Dr. Steinberg advertises to an international audience, and indeed, patients come from all over. Business is up uh, literally 80-fold from um, seven years ago. Steinberg says his Asian clients overwhelmingly favor boys because of cultural pressures. Canadians favor girls, but he doesn't know why. He says his American patients mainly come for, quote, family balancing. I come from a family of four girls, so I thought it would be nice to have a son. Bob and Mindy Harrison of Utah had four daughters, but felt like their family wasn't complete. I love playing with dolls, but Sometimes trucks are fun too. So they went through an in vitro fertilization procedure at Dr. Steinberg's office, an environment that required us to wear specialized outfits to prevent contamination. This is the lab and where the eggs are fertilized. Once you have a viable embryo, a single cell is extracted and then looked at under a high powered fluorescent microscope to see if that embryo is a male or female. Gender selection is considered controversial. Most countries have banned it. One of the fears is that it could manipulate the ratio of boys to girls. Though it's legal in the United States, the country's leading fertility organization discourages it. Some religious groups, meanwhile, don't like doctors interfering with what they consider God's plan. Other critics worry about the future, designing babies based on societal preferences. We could be opening the door to society where there are new kinds of inequality and new kinds of discrimination, a world that we really would not want to live in. I guess we just don't see an issue with it. We feel that as technology advances and we can take advantage to enhance our lives and the lives of others, it's a good thing. A good thing because Mindy and Bob now have their boys, twins. Hey. Trevor and Tristan are now eight months old. If we hadn't have gone through this procedure, these two little boys wouldn't be here. Dr. Steinberg says the technology is moving so fast that in addition to choosing things like hair and eye color, parents will be able to have babies that are healthier, taller, and maybe even more athletic. And Dr. Steinberg says he has absolutely no qualms of trying to give those parents exactly what they want. Okay, so that was a video, just a kind of a standard CNN reporting on a fertility clinic. And uh, we saw that, uh, what, what was the goal that this couple they were featuring, what were they trying to do? Diversify their family. Diversify their family because, well, they had four girls, right? And they wanted a boy. It's called uh, family balancing is the term they used for it. So um, what did they do? They went to this fertility clinic and they... They did in vitro fertilization. That means they generated you know, 15 to 20 um, embryos in this process, 15 to 20 embryonic human beings. Right? These are full-fledged full human beings, just at the very early, very young stage of, of development. Right? And then they looked at them under a, a microscope, these embryos, embryonic human beings, and they looked for the boys, right? Because they can see, based on your genetics, if you're a boy or a girl under the microscope. And what did they do with all the girls? Well, they didn't make the cut, right? Uh, it was the boys that they were looking for. So I say fertility clinics, crypto-eugenics, right? In this case, in this particular case, it was the, the boy they were looking for 
And, and the girl, that was the inferior genetics for that family, you know, the individual choice. And you could hear um, the dad at the end there saying, you know, why, why wouldn't we pursue this? This is for our own enhancement, our own, you know, our own personal choice, right? Our own, our own personal happiness, you know, that we're pursuing this. So again, you see the emphasis on the personal choice. However, don't lose sight of the fact that this is still eugenics, right? And um, uh, crypto eugenics. And it gets even worse because there's something called pre-implantation genetic diagnosis that is often coupled with in vitro fertilization, IVF, um, where the, the embryos, they're, they're very small people, right? Very small human beings, but you can still extract a cell. I mean, they're only, we're only seven, eight, eight cells large at this stage in, in life, but you can ex extract a cell from that person, the embryonic person, and um, do genetic testing on that cell and find out, does this, does this person have a genetic predisposition towards these different diseases, like what we've been talking about, you know, Down syndrome um, and other genetic conditions? Well, guess what happens to those children? Petri dish abortion, right? They don't make the cut. This is this bald-faced eugenics. Now, it's done on an individual basis, right? It's done on individual choice. But can it be described as anything else besides eugenics? And then, you know, it gets even, we get even deeper when you talk about genetic engineering. So there's, if you've heard in the news, there's this whole new um, genetic engineering uh, made uh, very, very plausible and capable through this CRISPR-Cas9 technology. Okay, so now you're, you're getting away from the negative eugenics where you just exclude those who have, were found to have um, undesirable genetics. That would be the negative eugenics. Now, genetic engineering, I mean, that's, the, that's like the holy grail for eugenicists. They can actually edit our genes, make us genetically modified organisms, and, and with the hope, their hope is to genetically enhance us and make us superior somehow with genetic engineering. And uh, CRISPR-Cas9 really, really does make that a reality. It's not science fiction anymore. Questions, comments there? So when you, uh, you and your wife went to the doctor and experienced this on your own, It's here now, too. Oh, yeah. Yeah, when you get a doctor who says, you need to go have a blood test, even though you don't want to, to test for these genetic conditions. That is the bias toward negative eugenics that, uh, that sociologists found, Dr. Wirtz. Well, um, okay, so I just want to, quickly cover two more slides here. Now, this one is from Oliver O'Donovan, this book, Begotten or Made. It's a, it's a good resource. I, um, if you're looking for a resource on, um, you know, thinking about this whole embryo technology business and in, in vitro fertilization and all that, um, Char, uh, Oliver O'Donovan, uh, he comes at this from a good angle, a good Christian kind of uh, evaluation of what it means to be a person and, you know, the difference between beginning and making. Now, of course, that's from the Nicene Creed, uh, begotten, not made. You know, he's, he's kind of borrowing that language from the Nicene Creed, but he's, he's really kind of an ethical evaluation of uh, what we're doing to people at the earliest stages of life at their embryonic form. And he says that um, kind of in the modern era, now that we're doing this kind of experimentation with uh, embryos, we have, shift, we have shifted from a kind of a begetting mindset that uh, we think of, of having children as something that a husband and wife do together to have a child and to share their love and care for that child and raise them up, you know, certainly in a Christian sense, raise them in the fear and knowledge of God and instruct them in the Christian faith. That's kind of a begetting mindset where you 
you have children to raise them up in your family. We have shifted from begetting children to making children. So making children is where you, you think of children more as a commodity, something like a product that you make or you buy, and it's uh, yours to own and, and do what you will with your, with your product. And you see this in the language, um, with, uh, instead of saying procreation, you know, uh, children are, are, they come about through procreation. What do we say nowadays? We say reproduction, which is the language of like a factory, right? You produce, you produce widgets on a factory line, right? And so our children as well, we're, we reproduce, we produce our children, we make them rather than beget them in, in more of like a familial kind of um, way of thinking of how children come about. And O'Donovan has this to say about uh, the practice of producing embryos through IVF. The practice of producing embryos by IVF in vitro fertilization with the intention of exploiting their special status for use in research is the clearest possible demonstration of the principle that when we start making human beings, right, making instead of begetting, when we start making human beings, we necessarily stop loving them. That that which is made rather than begotten becomes something that we have at our disposal, not someone with whom we can engage in brotherly fellowship. All right, so this, this, what he's saying there is that the shift in mindset from begetting children to making them has, has commodified children. They have become almost like a product that you can buy and sell and trade and make contracts over and all these things. Uh, certainly what seems to be happening, we're moving in this direction as we, we go further down this path of um, making children in, in test tubes, in vitro as it's called, in glass, um, in petri dishes, through IVF. It really commodifies the human being. And it's also dangerous, too, because um, the process of IVF requires that you freeze the embryos in liquid nitrogen. So the children, these embryonic children, have to go through this process of freezing in liquid nitrogen and then thawing. And you can lose 50, 70 percent of the children because they don't survive. I mean, just think about it. Would you want to be frozen under liquid nitrogen and thawed out and see what happens? A lot of these embryos don't make it through that process of freezing and thawing. But this gets back to our you know, question at the beginning, who is my neighbor? You know, who do we welcome into our, our neighborly circle of care and concern? And uh, G.K. Chesterton has a quote that I want to close with. He's talking about um, uh, the most inclusive institution in the world, and that is the family. And this is why he says the family is the most inclusive institution. The man who lives in a small community lives in a much larger world. We make our friends, we make our enemies, but God makes our next door neighbor. Okay, this is kind of getting at, you can choose your friends, but you can't choose your family. You know that proverb? Okay, the best way that a man could test his readiness to encounter the common variety of mankind would be to climb down a chimney into any house at random and get on as well as possible with the people inside. And that is essentially what each one of us did on the day that we were born. So long as you have groups of men chosen rationally, you have some special or a sectarian atmosphere. It is when you have groups of men chosen irrationally that you have men. The element of adventure begins to exist. In other words, when we step into the family, we stepped into a fairy tale. Okay, and I, I put this at the end of our study here, um, this whole idea that when we choose who it is that we associate with, like in groups or clubs or organizations, or even our, our friendships, you know, the, the cliques that we develop, when we choose who we associate with, that's a highly exclusive group, right? Because you choose who you want to associate with. But in the family, you have to get along with them, don't you? You don't get to choose who your family are. 
and, and to a lesser extent, who your neighbors are. Um, you have to make it work. That, that is what is incumbent upon us as Christians, is that we get along to the best of our ability, so far as it depends on us. We, we get along with our family, we welcome the people who are unwelcomable, and we, we do the best. You know, we go the extra mile, or we should go the extra mile to get along with family, right? We go much farther for family than we do for just some random acquaintance. So Chesterton is getting at this whole notion that it's actually the family that is the most inclusive institution, I mean, in, in the world, you know, because you accept everyone who is your family without qualification. And so this has implications for us as we think about how it is that we accept people who are considered eugenically inferior, right? And God is inviting us to, to expand our, um, our circle of friends and neighbors to those who are less and less eugenically desirable, just as he has welcomed us into his family. All right, uh, we're at time here, so any closing thoughts, comments, or questions? Very, very interesting. Yes, and we really just scratched the iceberg about this, you know. Um, uh, one thing I noticed in my research is that a lot of the books that were written about this topic are written from a more kind of liberal bent or more of a godless kind of mindset. There, there needs to be more work done, and there are some people doing some good work out there, but um, there, are need, there needs to be some more good work done on, on this whole history of the eugenics movement from a more kind of conservative or theologically Christian um, perspective, I think. I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done uh, in this area. And here I have some, just some resources <clears throat> if you want to read more, some good books and even a couple of websites uh, pertaining to this whole topic of eugenics. Um, so I just throw those up there for your benefit if you'd like to see those and uh, do some further investigation. This, these are some good places to start. So, But uh, we will end here. And, uh